I have greatly appreciated all of the messages that have preceded. When Brother Daniel was speaking this morning, I was thinking of a prophetic word I was given when I was still a teenager. And the Lord said uh, through a man of God to me, you have many set and rigid opinions. But right now I'm imparting to you a more pliable spirit. Now that was a sovereign act of grace. And I think we can all ask the Lord for that. Lord, in any area where I'm rigid, where I'm in a rut or routine in my life, would you impart a new spirit where I'm more flexible, where I'm more pliable? Isn't that wonderful that God can do that sovereignly? And you know, I was different from that moment on. A sovereign act of grace. I am imparting a more pliable spirit to you. Amen. I've so appreciated the fact that we are spreading the gospel to the nations, following the principles of the book of Acts, going to different countries, meeting key people, certain places, training leaders and letting them spread the word to the nation. And that's what we are doing by God's grace. I think Zion Fellowship um, is making a greater impact maybe than we realize. Oops, sorry. Do you know we have maybe nearly a half a million Zion books in China, in Mandarin? A quarter of a million books in Indonesia, in Bahasa. And we are getting things done here that can be dubbed in all the languages, spread to the nations. Being on TV, on the internet, spreading the word. And that's the goal of Zion Fellowship, to take the treasure that God has given to us, the truths that have changed our own hearts, and plant that in many other millions of hearts. Because God wants a glorious people compatible with himself. This morning I want to speak somewhat on the power of the tongue and write confessions when we are in difficulty. The importance of what we say when we are in pain or in a trial. You know, we often think that Genesis is the oldest book of the Bible but the book of Job was written four or 500 years before that. Around approximately the time of Abraham, not terribly long after the flood. And do you know what the book of Job is all about? It's all about words. Things that we say when we are in a trial. That whole book is about sins of the mouth and also write things. We read in the first chapter that Satan said, if you take away all of Job's blessings, he'll curse you to your face. And God allowed the protective hedge to be taken away. And in one day he lost everything. What did this man do? He fell down and worshiped. God is good all the time, he said, in effect. Isn't that wonderful? In yeah. all these things he did not sin with his lips, nor charge God foolishly. And then he went into a deeper trial of his health after losing his business, his servants, his family. He still maintained 
an, a good testimony. Do you know in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, there are three things that it requires to overcome Satan. We overcome him, number one, by the blood of the Lamb. But look at number two, by the word of our testimony. What we say when we're in pain. How did Job overcome Satan when he lost everything and was in agony? He fell down and worshiped. God is good all the time. Oh, God wants to refine our speech, especially when we are hurting and in pain. The book of Job is really all about sins of the mouth. Later, we find that Job, as the months of the trial went on, he became very discouraged and he did say some unspiritual things. And finally, after the Lord was silent for months, the Lord appeared in chapter 38. And he asked Job about 80 questions. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? How does this happen? Why is this and this? He couldn't say anything. And he realized that this very good man had sinned with his mouth. You know, I would say that the hardest part of a trial is when God is silent and is saying nothing. The Lord could have explained, well, in eight months from now, this trial is going to turn around and all of this. But no, God often cannot explain what he's doing when we're in pain and in a trial. In Job chapter 23, verse 8 through 10, Job is saying, oh, I can't find God. I go forward, he's not there. I go backward, he's not there. To my left side, he's not there. To my right side, I, I can't find him. I can't hear him. This is the hardest part of a trial. But then he said in the next verse, but he knows the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I'm going to come forth as pure gold. Do you know what the story of Job is all about? It's a good man being deeper purified in his speech and in his heart in order to rule and reign with Christ. God took a very good man and made him a better man. Let's turn to Job 19, verse 25 to 27. The reason why this man could go through this purifying, and Job represents the church going through the great tribulation to make them so purified to be a beautiful bride for Christ at his coming. I know that my Redeemer lives. Now this is 2,000 years before Christ. I know that my Redeemer lives that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. He's looking ahead 4,000 years later to the millennium. And then in the next verse, he sees himself resurrected. Though my skin and my worms, uh, my flesh become like worms. Worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I'm going to see God. He saw himself resurrected at the second coming of Christ, and he saw himself ruling and reigning with Christ on the earth in the millennial age. You know, we need a greater vision of being in the better resurrection and ruling with Christ. But this is what enables people to go through deep, purifying trials. But my main point is this. We overcome Satan by the word of our testimony. What did Job say? in his trial. Well, at first, of course, he did not sin with his lips nor charge God foolishly. Thank you, Lord. If we could turn to Revelation 
chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. One of the elders said, Who are these who are arrayed in white robes? Where do they come from? Then the next verse. And here is an explanation of the purpose for great tribulation. And most of the church does not understand this message, that the purpose for great tribulation is to do a deep purging, to prepare a beautiful bride who is going to rule and reign with him. God wants a bride that's compatible with himself. These are they who have come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. This is the real purpose of great tribulation. What does Job represent? A very good man going through a deep trial to make him a better man and receiving twice as much and having an eternal name and the blessing of God upon him. So this is the message of the book of Job. What we say when we are in trial. You know, later in his trial, his friends found fault with him. His wife was overwhelmed, losing her children and everything else, and she said some unspiritual things. And what did he say to her? Tranquilo. Calm down, emotions. God gives us many good times, but he also allows difficult times. We read in Genesis chapter eight, I believe verse 22, that God created the seasons, springtime and harvest, summer and winter, cold and heat. Do you know, I sense that the church is about to have a new season now. Amen. Winter speaks of barrenness, of cold, of darkness, of difficulty. But then spring and summer, fruitfulness, light and blessing and fruitfulness and flourishing. I've been praying all winter for a new season in the natural, but even more so in the spiritual for the church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Also, I wanted to mention a verse in Proverbs 27. Verse 11. Do you know who has suffered the most during the time of mankind? The Lord himself. God has suffered. God is so tender and so kind, not willing that any should perish. Do you know that when we hurt, our Father hurts. When his son was on the cross, his Father was hurting terribly. God so loved the world that he gave his son. But Proverbs 27, verse 11, do you know that God wants something to be able to say to his adversary? And when Job passed his test and did not sin with his lips, he said, listen to what God, uh, to Job, what he has said. He has found no fault with me. My son, be wise. Make my heart glad that I may answer him who reproaches me. We overcome Satan by the word of our testimony. And he passed his test. Although I will say this, in Job chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, do you know it's possible to quote a scripture to someone and kill them with it when it's out of season? And this is what his friends were saying to him. Job chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. He sang in effect to Job, a man reaps what he sows. Now, is that a scripture? You reap what you sow. And he said, I have seen they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. And it's a scripture. I mean, literally, it's in Galatians 5 and so forth, that we reap what we sow. And it's a true 
concept, but it was a wrong application at that time. Isn't it possible to, to terribly injure somebody by quoting the wrong scripture to them? And here he is, he's lost everything, he's devastated, and his friends are telling him, you reap what you sow, look at what everything that's gone wrong for you. You've lost your family, your business, your reputation, everything. What have you been doing in your personal life? Wrong application of scripture. It's important to have the right scripture. You can kill somebody by quoting a scripture to them out of season. Here are some of the things we need to say when we're in a deep trial that we learn from the book of Job. Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. God was silent. God was silent for months. Didn't explain the outcome. Ecclesiastes 3.11, there is a song. He makes everything beautiful in his time. We need to say, Lord, I don't understand, but I trust you. And I know one way or another that you're going to make everything beautiful in your time, whether I understand what's going on or not. In Mark 7:37, where it was said that he did all things well. These are things we need to say to God when we're in pain and we're in a trial and God is silent. Lord, I may not understand, but I trust you. And you will make everything beautiful in your time. You see, these are confessions that we need to make. This is how we overcome Satan, with the word of our testimony. Lord, you're good all the time. Matthew 12, 37. By our words, we are justified, and by our words, we are condemned. The power of our mouth. Proverbs 18, 21. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. You know that we can destroy a person with our mouth, saying wrong things about them. Do you know in Matthew 7, verse 12, the Lord sums up the whole Bible in Matthew 7, verse 12. As you would that men should do to you, you go and do that to them. For this is the whole teaching of the law and the prophets. This is a summary of the word of God. How do you want to be treated? You go and do that to the other person. Can you imagine what this world would be like if this golden rule was practiced? Not slandering anyone, not doing this or that or lying or deceiving. Listen, here is a summary. How do you want to be treated? You do that to other people. Amen. The mouth is very powerful. This earth, this universe was spoken into existence by the word, the living word of God. He is the word of God. In Ephesians 3, 9, at the end of the verse, it says that God created all things by Jesus Christ. He's the word. And you know what that means? Let's try to analyze this. God the Father authorized his son, the word, to speak in Genesis, let there be light. And there was light. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. 
He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. We need to know and understand the power of the mouth. You know, in a, in a court hearing, one little word can make the difference between the verdict of guilty or innocent. The power of words. You can destroy a person with words. Said behind their back or to their face. Listen to some of the Ten Commandments. You shall not lie. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not take God's name in vain. There's tremendous power in our words. I have a feeling a lot of us are going through trials right now. I'm going through one myself. But I have to maintain a constant testimony. Lord, I don't understand. You haven't explained when or how or why, but you do all things well, and I know you will make everything beautiful in your time. Amen. And that's the kind of testimony we have to have. We need to have that testimony, that original testimony of Job, who did not sin with his lips, nor charge God foolishly. You know, later in his trial, he did say some ungodly things. And he said, God enjoys seeing the innocent suffer and, and things like that. He did say some unspiritual things later. And when the Lord finally did appear to him in chapter 38, oh, did Job realize how terrible when he came in the presence of a light. When Isaiah was taken up to heaven in the presence of him who is the light, he discovered hidden needs in his own life and said, oh, I'm a man of unclean lips. He was a very good man. But you know, coming into the full presence of the light, he discovered hidden needs in his heart. And he made confession, and there was a fresh purging. His lips were purged. But this is what the book of Job is all about. Sins of the mouth. You will find no sins of Job that were acts of sin, but they were sins of things that he said with his mouth that needed to be purged. Well, I want to come back now to the thought of the, the mouth. And Numbers 14 is the classic example. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 14. In the introduction of this chapter, we find that the whole congregation were lifting up their voice and weeping, and they were complaining and criticizing God. Verse 2, they were saying, oh, God brought us out here because he hates us into the wilderness that we should die and so forth. What a terrible thing to, to say constantly. They said this for two years, and God put up with this for two years of constantly criticizing God. And do you know what happened? Later in that chapter... God gave everyone what they confessed. And I'd like to read a couple of very, very important verses here. It's, and I'd like to summarize it in verse 28. Say unto them, as truly as I live, says the Lord, as you have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. You say, I'm no good, I hate you, I brought you out here just to slay you in the wilderness. All right, that's what you'll have, every one of you. But Caleb and Joshua said, oh no, that's not so. These giants in the land are grasshoppers. God is so much bigger than the problem. And so God said to Caleb and Joshua, that's what you say about me? You're going in and everything that I promise you will have. 
But you know something, now listen, this is very, very important. This Numbers chapter 28, I'm sorry, 14 and verse 28. Everyone got what they confessed. So I like to say nice things to God. <laughs> Lord, you're so much bigger than my problem. You're going to do far above what I can ask or think. I have not seen or ear heard or entered into the heart of men the things that you prepared for them that love and wait for you. Amen. And you know what? It's not flattery to God. It's just saying the truth. You're more than wonderful. That's not flattery. It's true. We cannot understand how great and good he is. But listen, this is a verse to live by and to remember Everyone got what they were saying. Israel said, God hates us. He brought us out here just to do us evil, for us to die in the wilderness. And God heard that for two years. And he said, all right, as you've spoken in my hearing, this is what you'll have. But Caleb and Joshua, they've said something different. God is bigger than the problem. And the enemy is nothing. God is bigger than the problem. Israel was saying the problem is bigger than God, but everyone got what they said. And this is why God wants to change our confession. The power, by our words, we are justified or condemned. In the tongue is the power of life and death. What do we say in our trial? Yes, we're in pain. But you know, I think God suffers even more than we do. He's so tender and so kind. But anything he allows in our life is because he has a plan to bless us exceedingly. Amen. What if you were born during that time in the wilderness? Which later became the Joshua generation. Do you think maybe they were sick and tired of following their parents in a place of wandering, going nowhere for year after year? I think I'd be sick and tired of going nowhere for years. And you know what? At the end of the 40 years, they were more than ready to not make the same mistakes and to enter into the promises, amen, and to be circumcised and to go in and possess what had been promised 450 years earlier. Thank you, Lord. Oh, I'm sick and tired of wandering with my parents going nowhere. Amen. Let's learn from the mistakes of our forefathers. As you have spoken in my hearing, so will I do to you. I'm going to give everyone what you say. Do you see the importance of the confession of our lips? Especially when we are in pain and in trouble. We must not find fault with God. Lord, I may not understand the whole thing, but I trust you. And you are good all the time. Amen. So we need to remember Deuteronomy 23, verse 5, the last part of the verse, that our God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee because the Lord your God loved you. You know that God can cause every bad thing that happens and turn it around and make it work in our favor when we please him. And that's what I love about the life of Joseph. Can you imagine being a 17-year-old and having your older brothers wanting to kill you? And uh, they decided, well, let's just ship him off as a slave. But isn't it interesting that the very place where they shipped him off was the very place where his dream was going to be fulfilled? And all the terrible things that happened to him, the lies, the deceit, and everything that happened to him, being imprisoned in a foreign land, God was using all of that to put iron in his soul 
to make him a world deliverer. That when there were no answers, in his generation, this man had answers, and he went through some terrible pain, but all of that was to make him a world deliverer. I do believe that the Joseph spirit and that calling is upon this congregation, this fellowship, that in a time of crisis in the world, that God will give us food for the nations. Amen. Words to speak when there are no answers. That is what God has called this generation to, and this congregation to, the Joseph. Well, we've already mentioned that when the Lord appeared to Job in chapter 38, in verse 4, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Job, you're saying some very unwise things with your mouth and finding fault with me. So just in closing with words here, in Ephesians 5.28, I've never found a scripture verse put on a wall that says this, that he that loves his wife loves himself. Now, isn't this interesting? That a man and woman are one flesh. When you hurt another person, you're hurting yourself. Do you want something very good to happen to you? Be good to your spouse. We could also say to the women, she that is good to her husband is being good to herself. And so it's very, very important that we understand the purpose of marriage, that is to, it is to develop character in us, forgiveness, forbearance, wisdom, understanding, many other things, because we are being prepared for our heavenly bridegroom. This is the whole purpose of marriage, to develop character in us, forgiveness, wisdom, understanding, and much more. So we are to love our neighbor as ourself. And when we are good to other people, we are being good to ourself. When we are being good to our spouse, we are being good to ourself. Amen. Well, this is the gist of what I wanted to say today. Saying the right things when we're hurting by God's grace. It's only by God's grace. Job said some marvelous things in his pain. In all this, Job did not sin with his lips nor charge God foolishly. Later, yes, he did say some things that he shouldn't have said, and God later corrected his speech. And at the end, he said, oh, I've said things I had known nothing about. And he was cleansed, and he got a double anointing and the eternal name of honor. So may we learn from the book of Job, the oldest book in the Bible, written four or five hundred years before Genesis, that this message of words saying the right thing when we're in pain by God's grace. God bless you. Amen.